Hey Nick. Hey Liam. What do you do with a sick wasp? I don't know. What do you do with a sick wasp? Take it to the waspital. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> the waspital. That's physically painful. Physically painful. <laughs> That's what that is. Oh my goodness. The waspital. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Entocast with Liam and Nick, an insect podcast kindly sponsored by the Royal Entomological Society. As it's August, we thought we'd do an episode on something that may be relevant to you right now, something you might be seeing a lot of, and that is wasps. Specifically, today we're going to be talking about why wasps are fascinating, but also why we should perhaps be giving a little more love to our Vespine friends. But wasps are awful. Why should we be giving any love to them at all? Like, they just come and steal your picnics. That's all wasps are, surely. Oh, no. Wasps, just picnic stealers. Wasps are actually my favourite group of insects. They're my favourite group of animals. They're, they're so cool. I thought your cool. favourite group was bees. No. Um, bees and wasps are both cool. But if I had to pick between the two, I, I probably would hunt for the wasp. Partly because they get a lot of hate and I think it's totally unwarranted. Yeah, I mean, perhaps it is a little bit unwarranted. But, I mean, to guess to start off with, what... What do we actually mean when we say wasp? Because we had this same thing with the bees. We're like, what exactly is a bee? So when I think of a wasp, because I think of bees as vegetarian wasps, I just think of wasps as carnivorous bees that are kind of less fluffy. But there's probably a little bit more to it than that. Yeah, so it's kind of like one of these terms where it can be used in different contexts to mean different groups of animals. Um, So in general, like just on the street, if you say the word wasp, I'm just on the street. <laughs> I'm you know, forever going down into the hood and just saying, hey man, wasp. What's that, I, man? I have never been to the hood. I think that, that should be cut, obvious. We're definitely going to have to cut that out. <laughs> so like, when, when you're just talking to people in general and you say the word wasp, we automatically go to the social wasps, you know, what they call in America, yellow jackets. And mm. sometimes in, I've heard people in the UK refer to social wasps being yellow jackets and tea. And it's kind of quite a clear um, thing in people's minds. Yeah. You think of the brightly coloured black and yellow wasp that comes and investigates your food. That's normally the one you would think of. But the term wasps can also include all of these other groups of hymenopterans. So whenever we talk about wasps, it's pretty much always insects within the order Hymenoptera. And as you may remember from when we looked at this group when we did our episode on bees, uh, this also includes all other things like saw flies and then all these parasitic Hymenopterans and then also these ants and kind of non-bee aculeates. So we have our social wasps, so we've got quite a clear idea of what they are. These are these ones where they're living in colonies um, with a queen, and there's different degrees of sociality within these wasps, which is quite interesting. Um, And there can be potentially nests with hundreds of individuals and, you know, the kind of thing you might find in an attic and what not really want to disturb because it might not end so well for you. <laughs> but then, I'm going to test to that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then in this country, we also have um, many, many species of solitary wasp. Mm-hmm. So these are still within the aculeata. And some of these solitary wasps are actually more closely related to bees than they are to the social wasps. And these solitary wasps are doing kind of similar things to the social wasps in that they are predatory, um, they're hunting for prey to provision for their larva. Mm-hmm. So you remember how we talked about bees were, certain groups of bees were collecting uh, pollen and then they were provisioning it like maybe in a bee hotel or in mines in the ground. The wasps are doing very similar things. There's lots of bigger wasps which will take, and instead of it being pollen this time it's prey. And this can be prey that they've killed, but quite often it'll be things that they sting mm-hmm. and paralyse to keep it fresher for longer. So by the time that the egg hatches into a small wasp larva, uh, the prey is still alive. So it's got this nice fresh 
food source, which is kind of horrific for the <laughs> the poor little caterpillar <laughs> or, or whatever it is that's being eaten, but useful for the wasp. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think the major thing is that the larva, whether it be bees or wasps, they need a lot of protein. So for wasps, the protein they're choosing is just other insects, whereas bees, they're choosing pollen. Yeah. And that's probably the major thing. But it, it's incredible. Yeah. I was doing a little bit of reading... Uh, before this and I came across a paper by a bloke called Harris from 1996 and in it it suggests that some uh, species of social wolves can go through hundreds of kilos of prey and considering an insect is maybe a tenth of a gram or something like that that is an enormous amount of insects I mean I, ca- I can't quite even imagine what hundreds of kilos of an insect would look like yeah it's weird it's, it's phenomenal and I guess that becomes because these are social wasps living in big colonies that they're rearing so much brood simultaneously that they're just they by necessity they're having to go out and spend an awful lot of time hunting foraging for this insect prey and then bringing it back. The, the other things worth saying with wasps is, so we have this kind of nice kind of clear group where we've got these solitary wasps and these social wasps, but wasps also can refer to um, what used to be called the parasitica. Uh, mm. I think this is a, now a defunct term, but it generally refers to these parasitic insects, uh, things like the igneumons and the briconids and the calcids. These are things that are going out and they're injecting their eggs directly into or onto their prey and have these kind of Ridley Scott inspirational life cycles <laughs> where they're eating the host on the from the inside out or feeding on the host and then erupting out of them. Yeah, I once had a infestation uh, in my Osmia bicornis of these parasitic wolves. So I can attest they are quite cool. They're a bit of a pain at the time, but it's quite incredible. They just have these great big long overpositors that they can pierce the cocoon and straight into the developing bee and they lay their eggs inside there and it'll eat the bee from the inside out and then you'll open up your cocoon hoping for a nice little osmia and inside there's loads of wriggling lava, (laughs) which is not ideal. But this group of um, parasitic uh, wasps is absolutely massive in terms of diversity. And you talk to coleopterists and they quite often they say beetles are the most diverse group. You talk to someone who studies these parasitic wasps and they say, oh no, it's actually that these are the most diverse group of animals. Uh, The reason that we can't say for sure is that we haven't even discovered them all yet. Whereas we've discovered a lot more beetles just because historically it was a more popular group for taxonomists. Wasps, from what we've been saying, Clearly, clearly very biased. But from what we've been saying, they sound really fascinating. So why is it that people dislike wasps? Is it just because they are, like I said, picnic botherers? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, And it goes back to the point when you go out and say the word wasp, people automatically arrive at social wasp. So they instantly were disregarding hundreds of thousands of all these fascinating species that quite often pay a very useful service. I mean, a lot of these parasitic wasps are laying into things which would otherwise be pests Mm. Um, and a lot of people their only experience with these social wasps is like you said they're coming and being a nuisance to them they're either getting into their food or they're stinging them and I think stinging is one of the major reasons why people are are so against the idea of wasps so yeah in general wasps don't tend to be that popular and there's even uh, anti-wasps memes on the internet of things like wasps are jerks and comparing them to the honeybee and saying oh honeybees are great they give us honey and they don't sting you and wasps I, are... I, I've been stung by a honeybee <laughs> well the, the funny thing is honeybees are actually almost always more aggressive than yeah. wasps and uh, most of the time if you leave wasps alone they're not interested in being aggressive towards you at all I have a little party trick where I actually I will put a little bit of sugary water like lemonade or something on my finger at a picnic and let the wasps come up and drink from it and then fly off and then you see them come back later for some more and you know it doesn't bother me at all and then the other one is people people see hornets and they see they're so much bigger and they say oh then you know they're bright yellow and black and red they must and they're so big and they must have a big stinger they must be like evil and horrible things but the funny thing is hornets are actually very very peaceful insects and most of the time, you don't even see them because they're up at the top of the trees foraging. Yeah. No, they forage from things that we don't eat ourselves. Uh, the reason you see the social wasps is they've got 
to use a sort of funny term that doesn't really apply to insects, they've got a sweet tooth, essentially. Yeah. Uh, especially in the later part of the year, because throughout the early part of the year, they've got a lot of lava in the nest, so they have to collect a lot of protein, so they get to collect a lot of insects. Uh, whereas later on in the year, there's fewer lava, and so they just are looking for sweet sugar sources, because when the larvae are growing, they actually produce some of the sweet sources. So it's later on in the year, which is when people get this annoyance with wasps. Yeah, and they tend to have a hankering for soft fruits as well, and they can actually even be pests on certain certain fruit trees where they're eating the fruits. It's funny what you say, because I was talking to my mum about this, and she was surprised that there was actually more than one species of wasp. I think she's only ever really encountered the common wasp. And I think that's part of the reason. And she asked me that famous question, which is, what is the point of wasps? Yeah, and that's a question I get quite a lot. And to help us answer it, we're actually going to go and talk now with Dr. Syrian Sumner, who is known as Wasp Woman. <laughs> and I'm sure she can enlighten to us on the many reasons why we should love wasps. I am Dr. Serian Sumner and I am a reader in behavioural ecology at University College London and I study social insects. I'm interested in their behaviour and their evolution. So what sort of social insects are you investigating? Well, I'm particularly fond of wasps, I have to admit. Um, I know that they are generally the, the least favourite of most people's insects, <laughs> maybe perhaps alongside uh, other creepy crawlies. Um, but yeah, no, I love wasps. I, I think they're amazing. I think they are very underappreciated. Um, and uh, I think we have to learn more about them. But that segues quite nicely into something that we were quite interested to talk to you about. So you've told us that you're about to conduct a big wasp count. Could you tell us what that is? Yeah, so we've actually just launched it. Uh, the Big Wasp Survey, it's called. Um, we have a website, bigwaspsurvey.org. And um, it's all about harnessing the public's dislike of wasps in order to help us, the scientists, learn more about them. So the problem is that everybody understands and appreciates bees. Everybody loves bees. They're cuddly. They're cute. They pollinate. And they're really good for the world. And we cannot live without them. Well, actually, the same can be said for wasps, uh, because wasps are really important predators. Um, and in fact, we know that wasps are generalists. They'll eat anything that they come across, any, um, any carrion, any insect, any arthropod. Um, and by doing so, they are doing us a great service uh, by getting rid of a lot of the unwanted uh, pests that are around us. So, for example, without wasps, we'd have your, your tomato plants would be inundated with aphids and your cabbages would be riddled with caterpillars. Um, so wasps are going around, unbeknownst to you, removing all these pests from your garden. Um, and so they, they perform a really important service, both to the ecosystem and also to, uh, to humans. So what we wanted to do was to learn more about the wasps, because it's actually not just the general public who dislike wasps. Um, it's also the scientists. In fact, there are so few people studying wasps, and particularly even fewer people studying the yellow jacket wasps which most people will be familiar with in the uh, little ones that buzz around your beer or your barbecue in the summer. Um, and in fact, it's exactly that, the, uh, the, the buzzing around your barbecue and your beer that we wanted to exploit with our big wasp survey. So what we're asking the public around the UK to do is to put out a, a beer trap. We are telling you how to make these. They're very simple. You get a plastic bottle, uh, cut the top third off, invert it, put a bit of string on the bottle to hang it up and open a can of beer, which is always a good thing. <laughs> Stick the beer, half, half a can of beer in the trap, half a can for you, um, and hang it in a tree. And then we're asking you to leave the trap out for a week and thereafter drain off the beer, put the wasps in an envelope and post them to us. And then what we're going to do with them is identify the different species. And hopefully, if we get samples sent to us from all over the UK, from urban and rural environments, we hope to be able to uh, tell you something interesting about the distribution and abundance of the different species of social wasps. So how are you going to get people involved with this? Because as you said, a lot of people don't really like wasps that much. Is it just the fact that 
the wasps are going to go into the trap and then die? Is that how you're going to get people to do it? Well, I I know very few people who are not happy to kill a wasp. Um, I mean, I, I love wasps and I'm still happy to kill them in the name of science. But there are, I mean, the, the time of year that we're doing this survey it is over the next two weeks. So it's from bank holiday in August through to the first week of September. And at this time of year, the colonies are really winding down. So the wasps that you are collecting in your trap are workers. And the colonies are very much at the end of their colony life cycle. So most of the larvae, the small grubs, have been fed fully and are pupating and no longer need feeding. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why we think that wasps start bothering us at this time of year, because they have less uh, larvae to feed. So they're not necessarily looking for um, protein. They're looking more for sugar. So basically, the wasps that you're removing for your traps are the wasps that are going to die in a couple of weeks anyway. Um, but another reason why you shouldn't be too worried is that the average colony of your jacket wasp has about 10,000 workers. Now, based on other studies that have used these beer traps, um, we expect the average garden to be catching up to 10 wasps. So even if we get 1,000 people across the UK sending in their traps, it's still going to be probably less wasps than are in a single wasp colony. So we don't think, even though we're asking you to kill wasps, it's not going to have any effect on the population. So what is the end goal with uh, the survey then? So you said you're going to measure just like the species abundance and diversity. What do you hope to gain from understanding that? Well, we understand very little about social wasps in general. Um, and in the UK, I mean, the UK is, is second to none, really, in having a, a team of ready and able, very able entomologists scattered all over the country who submit their records of the bees, wasps and ants that they see to the Bee Wars uh, website, so the uh, Bees, Wasps and Ants recording scheme. And that's really valuable data for scientists to look at the distribution of species. And also, in this day and age where we're worried about declining populations or invasive populations, invasive species, those types of data are really, really valuable. Um, but wasps are just not reported very much, even by that entomology community. Having said that, there are, some, there are a small handful of very eminent wasp recorders in the UK um, whose data go back 30, 40 years, and that's been incredibly valuable um, to science. So what we hope to do with the data is to, this will, uh, because we're getting everybody to put out their traps at the same time of year, just over a two-week period, we, we should be able to compare um, the abundance of different species across different areas of the UK. And we're particularly interested in how habitats might influence um, wasp species abundance. So Vespula vulgaris is a common yellow jacket wasp. Uh, we might expect to find that more in urban areas. And less common species like Vespula rufa, the red wasp, would be more expected in the rural areas or the wooded areas. Um, we're also interested to find if these traps are going to be useful in detecting the invasive Asian hornet. Um, there's been two or three sightings across the UK in the last year or so, and it's of great uh, conservation concern. Um, so our traps are likely to pick up those hornets as well. One question that people always ask about wasps, and I'm hoping you have a really good answer to it, is what is the point of wasps? Uh, well, there are many points of wasps. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess, I guess the, the one thing that I did mention earlier is that they are really important predators, um, pest controllers. So they are top predators. Um, there are a few things that eat wasps. And so they're very important in controlling the populations of other insects and other arthropods. I guess another thing that wasps that is underappreciated is that wasps do, in fact, pollinate. Um, so wasps, in fact, the other day I, was, I happened to be in Portugal and I saw a Polistes wasp on a flower pollinating. Um, so at, especially at this time of year in the UK, the wasps have less brood to, to rear. Um, and so they'll start to look for sugar. And that's when you find them on plants. And so um, unlike bees, which tend to be very specialist for particular types of plants, 
Wasps, again, are very generalist and opportunistic in their pollination. Everything has its role in the ecosystem. And I think wasps actually do have a, a very important role. Um, and, and I think we just need more research to really be able to um, put a value on their role. Yeah, no, definitely. And hopefully this survey will give us a little bit more insight into their role. So what would you say is the best thing about wasps for you personally? Uh, well, OK. So the other aspect of my research is I'm interested in the evolution of social behaviour and social sociality. Um, and one of the brilliant things about wasps is that they provide us with snapshots in evolutionary time in the process of evolving social life. So most people think about social insects in terms of something like the honeybee or ant colonies, where you've got hundreds of thousands of individuals living together in a very highly coordinated um, society like a superorganism with one or a few individuals who lay the eggs, they're the queens, and then all the, um, the other individuals will be the workers who help raise the brood of those queens. Um, but in fact, that is kind of like the epitome of social evolution. Um, and what I'm more interested in is the process by which we get there. All of the social insects evolved originally from a solitary ancestor, so like a solitary digger wasp, for example, who would have done all the foraging and all the reproduction herself. Um, and at some point in evolutionary time, those uh, solitary individuals would have uh, become group living. So they'll start to live together in a group and that they'll show a division of reproductive labor. So some of them will become the egg layers, some of them will become the foragers and they'll divide up reproduction amongst them. As you progress up the ladder of, of um, social evolution, the wasps provide us with examples of increasing levels of social complexity. And this is particularly apparent in the queen and worker caste and how different queens and workers become in the more complex uh, social uh, systems. So the wasps that I study um, represent all the different stages in the ladder of social evolution. So it, it basically they um, allow us to unpick the process of evolution. So it's almost like evolution has provided us with the perfect science experiment. Coming back to the big wasp survey then, uh, so the people are collecting these wasps and then you said they're posting them to you uh so they post them to uh, do you have like a team of people who are going to be going through this or is it just you how does it all work uh so so this study is in collaboration with uh professor adam hart at the university of gloucestershire um so he and i are the scientists who are running it and we're very uh, fortunate to have sponsorship from the royal entomological society and it's thanks to the Royal Entomological Society that we are able to have the public posting in their wasp samples to us. Um, so we have some free post addresses on our website. So you fill in the form. When you've collected your wasps, you fill in the form online, and that will generate um, an individual collector number for you and give you the free post address. And then you wrap your insects up in tinfoil and uh, pop them in, in, in a normal A4 or A, A5 envelope to us. Uh, to, to, the, to the free post address. Uh, so what happens then? Well, we've no idea how many people are going to send in their wasps and also how many wasps are going to be in these different traps. So I had a trap the other day, which I've been hanging in my garden, that only had um, two or three wasps. But then a friend of mine from down the road brought me his traps and it had 140 wasps in it. Wow. <laughs> um, it <laughs> So, you know, we really don't know how many we're going to get. What we'd like is a good spread of traps from across the country. Um, so the numbers of wasps themselves aren't as important as the number of traps. And we're also interested to know that if you put a trap out and you found no wasps or no insects, then we'd like you to tell us about that as well, because that does tell us something about where you are in your, your region and the abundance in your region. Um but uh, what are we going to do with them once we get them? Uh, well, we're going to have some students, some undergraduate students are lined up to um, identify them. And at face value, these wasps do look quite difficult to identify. Um, there, are, there are eight common species of, of social wasps in the UK. And they're all variations on a yellow and black stripy theme. <laughs> um, but you can use the facial markings and the markings on the body, on the thorax, 
um, and the sizes of the mandibles, of the, the mouth parts, to identify the species pretty reliably to species level. So we're going to have uh, some very uh, willing and able undergraduates here at UCL who are going to trawl through the samples. Um, of course, that all depends on how many we get. If we get thousands, we might have to uh, uh, scale up the plan. And so if uh, anyone wants to get involved with it, where would they go to find the information about it? Yes, please visit our website. It's the bigwaspsurvey.org. And you can also follow us on Twitter at Big Wasp Survey. Um, and also you can email us, info at bigwaspsurvey.org. Um, so, yeah, many ways to uh, get in touch. Um, and it's this full information on our website about wasps, about the types of species that you find in the UK, how to make a trap, there's even a little video, um, how to submit your WASP data, and even some activities. For, we've got some lovely uh, printout masks of WASPs that the kids can colour in uh, whilst you're busy playing with beer. <laughs> and is this going to be an ongoing survey? Is this going to happen each year? Well, we don't know yet. Let's see how it goes. Um, this is the first year. Uh, it all depends on how eager and keen uh, the public are. So we're relying on the public, on your listeners and all your friends and family to, to take part. So if the public um, do their bit and uh, kill wasps in the name of science <laughs> using beer, um, then we, will, we hope that we will roll it out. Uh, next year and thereafter but this is very much a pilot year so uh, let's see how it goes well it's very exciting and i hope the postman is prepared to receive a lot of dead wasps uh through the post <laughs> yeah hopefully they won't realize <laughs> uh, yeah so i guess the other important thing to say is that the survey is is taking place between the 26th of august and the 10th of september the reason for that is that we want to be able to compare the same time window across the UK. So it's really important that if you are going to take part um, and just leave it there for a week, just remember to collect it seven days later. Um, and it's all done and dusted quite quickly with very little effort, actually. Um, very little effort. Fantastic. Uh, that is brilliant. Thank you very much, Dr. Sirian Sumner. Well, thank you. And good luck with it all. <laughs> good luck with the survey. <laughs> thank you. I Thank you very much. All right. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Wow. So that was a really interesting to hear from Syrian there um, about this WAP survey. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to taking part and maybe even seeing some interesting results. Yeah, I, I think it is uh, fascinating, this entire idea of the survey, just like harnessing people's dislike for wasps in order to get them involved. And I never realised, because they're so common, that social wasps were quite understudied. Like Whenever I see a common species, I just assume we know a lot about it, because it is common and it would be easy to study, but apparently not. Yeah, and I love it when you start to look at some of these common species, but even still there's these mind-blowing facts that you just didn't know before, and you start reading them, and you suddenly this whole new world opens up, and you start thinking, wow, like, for example, the wasps eating kilograms of prey. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. And I was looking into this as well, about these being such uh, important predators, and uh, I found out it's an another one of these crazy facts that not only are these literally taking kilograms of prey out of the ecosystem every year, but um, in New Zealand, uh, a lot of um, wasps have been introduced from the UK um, and they've actually become invasive. They're actually a conservation concern because they are so efficient at collecting insect prey. And it's actually been found that they're outcompeting some of the native New Zealand insectivorous birds. Wow. Geez, so like, <laughs> I'm just trying to, I guess, yeah, with kilograms of prey, you may well outcompete a bird, because I can't imagine a bird eating that much, but it just seems insane that these little tiny insects are outcompeting birds. So these, the yellow jackets, uh, the yeah, common Yeah, these wasps. are the social common wasps, same as we have uh, in, you'll be getting in the wasp survey. And the, the other thing about wasps being uh, these really effective predators, it's not just the amount of insects they remove from the system, it's the fact that they are this higher trophic level and they are so generalist, they'll take all sorts of things. So with a lot of classic biocontrol, you have a, an increase in the pest population. So you introduce the control agent and then it's kind of the Lotka Volterum ecological predator to prey 
cycle where you oh have... God, I'm having flashbacks to <laughs> ecology classes. <laughs> <laughs> the population dynamics, like, yeah, spike, and they, and crash, they spike, spike and crash. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But because you, what's the generalist, their population kind of just increases in the spring and then carries on increasing throughout the summer before kind of plateauing. So you have this uh, more standardised high population level. So they're always applying control. So there's no lag period between when the pest is there and then the predators are a high enough population to affect it, which can be quite useful for crops which have a very short time window where they could be affected by pest damage. Yeah, without a lag, you're probably going to end up with a population crash, which is good for agriculture. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with Locker Volta, we'll put a picture in. You probably will be familiar with it, but it's nice to have a little, bit of a refresh. We'll put a picture in the show notes. And because was uh, effective in this way, they have actually been used successfully in a number of crops in the past. And I always find it quite surprising how they're not more widely used in modern agriculture. But, you know, things like cotton and tobacco, cabbage, coffee, fruit, even timber, they've successfully been utilised. And another thing that Syrian talked about was the fact that uh, they're really good pollinators, actually. And there's so many different species of wasp, they can actually be really specific. So, for example, on Chilaglottis orchids, they're only pollinated by a single specific species of wasp, which is just like an insanely narrow mutualism that they've uh, evolved there. Mm, and I think there's a, a similar thing in the figs with the fig wasp as well. And that's a whole fascinating life cycle. If you're interested, I definitely recommend looking up that. You actually have these populations of wasps living inside the fig fruit. And without them, the fig cannot be pollinated. This is an example of how plants have um, exploited wasps and developed these mutualist relationships. And uh, some plants do some really interesting things. Um, for example, some are able to mimic wasp sex pheromones to trick wasps to come in. And then when the wasps are there, they might just happen to eat some of the pests which have been feeding on the plant. Uh, and other plants as well, when they, um, they're attacked by something like a caterpillar, which is eating them, they release uh, damage volatiles so they're releasing chemicals into the air and then the wasps smell these chemicals and they think oh that's a plant getting eaten that means food so then the wasp comes in and then eats the caterpillars so the plant is calling it a bit like the bat symbol <laughs> that's a perfect analogy i wish i'd had you when i was writing my dissertation for my masters because i actually worked on these uh, volatiles and i worked on what is known as tritrophic interaction. So where you have a pest species feeding on a plant and the plant then calls in a predator of that pest species. And if you ever think plants are just sitting there and they don't really do anything, look into how plants communicate with one another and it is genuinely incredible. So for instance, some plants, if they're just nearby other plants that have been attacked by something, they will then upregulate these defense compounds. And like you say, they bring in other uh, species, these predators, to help them defend against these things, including wasps. And if you're still not convinced that wasps are awesome, I have the absolute best show-stopping fact, which will convince you that wasps are our best animals in the world, and you'll agree with me, they'll be your favorite animals. And well, don't let it be show-stopping, because then we'll have to stop the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, all good things must come to an end. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, do you like beer? I do like beer. Do you like bread? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what these things have in common is yeast, and it has actually been found in a recent paper in 2012 that the common yeast, the brewer's yeast... Um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Yeah, that's the one. When we found it in nature, we usually find it in the autumn on the surface of fruits and stuff, and then it's then using fermenting, and that's why it's useful for quite a lot of these products. But we were never really sure where it went for the rest of the year. Obviously, it has to be somewhere, either in spores or growing in particular habitats. And then one of the theories was that it might actually be surviving in the guts of wasps. So as you mentioned before, wasps do enjoy eating soft fruit. So if they're going to this fruit into it, they're going to end up ingesting uh, the yeast. And then it's going to be in their guts. So the researchers went out and they actually sampled wasp guts. And this is the same. This is the common uh, social wasps. And they found um, the yeast surviving throughout the winter inside the guts of this wasp, where then it can then in the spring go out and reinfect um, other fruits in the environment. 
Oh, wow, that's, that's incredible. I mean, I never really thought about where yeast goes during the winter, but I guess, yes, it must go somewhere. And my instinct would be that probably survives in the guts of other insects as well if it do, if it survives in wasp insects too but that's really interesting the interesting thing about the wasp as well is because um queens um are hibernating through the winter that's a direct um place for its survival a lot of other insects if they did get the yeast in their gut mm. they would die yeah so it's not true. good for the yeast whereas the wasp is like a direct um vector from the one year to the next and one of the my personal favourite things when people say what have wasps contributed to our site if you don't like anything that comes from yeast I mean I don't know how you could possibly not enjoy at least one of those things but if you don't (laughs) beer bread yeah well it's hard to argue that paper has not transformed pretty much all of human culture you know paper's pretty useful and it was actually wasps which inspired us to develop paper so around 1005 AD there was a official in the Chinese court of the Han Dynasty called Kai Lun. And the story goes that he watched wasps in his garden uh, chewing up mulching wood to then take back and build their paper nests. And it was by observing this that inspired him to develop the idea of mulching wood uh, to make paper. So modern paper, that's, that's the story of where it comes from. So we can thank wasps for that too. Wow. So basically, what we're trying to say in the least biased way possible is wasps are awesome and you should like them. <laughs> yeah, and, and they're beautiful too. I mean, it's really some stunning, stunning uh, diversity in form and colour and life cycle. Yeah, we'll be sure to put some really cool pictures of wasps on the show notes so you can see that in your podcast provider or on the website. Next time you go to swap a pesky wasp, maybe just think twice. Think about some of the the mind-blowing facts we've laid on you here today (laughs) and uh, just hesitate maybe before you do squash it. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe do, yes. (laughs) Well, I think that's all we've got time for this month. But be sure to join us again next month when we'll be talking about outreach in entomology. But yeah, no, so it was really interesting to talk to Syrian and I hope you guys have got a better impression of what wasps are and they're not just those ones that bother your picnics and do get involved with the big wasp survey it sounds like a really interesting really uh, easy uh, piece of work that you can do at home to start seeing the, the different types of wasps which you might have in your garden and we'll be sure to include the links to the websites and all the other info about the uh, big wasp survey in the show notes And as always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to uh, contact us through our website at entocast.com or contact us on Twitter at entocast. Definitely. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and tell all your friends about it, because if you do, it makes us happy and you won't want to make us sad, would you? (laughs) But that's all we've got time for. So thank you again for listening. Goodbye. Bye. Thank God. (laughs) This is what I've been waiting for since we started.